Hello, welcome to episode 195 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand One Movies You Must See Before You Die, 1935's Bride of Frankenstein. And yes, before we even get started on the review, I do have a massive zit on the side of my face. It feels like talking about these horror films over the past few days has exacerbated the issue greatly, and I feel like in a few weeks' time after I've talked about a bunch more horror films, literally the only thing that will be left will be a zit, and uh, we'll be looking at the zit from another world, and it will completely overtake my entire face. That's what it feels like right now, but either way, on with the video, Bride of Frankenstein. I was really surprised by this one. Last year I talked about the 1931 Frankenstein movie directed by James Whale and I was really surprised by that film. I was expecting something a lot more literally lumbering, you know, in terms of the monster, but it turned out to be a bit more sensitive and, and had a real heart and soul to it that I wasn't expecting amidst all the craziness and the, it's alive, you know. It had something to say about man creating man, I suppose, or attempting to, uh, man trying to play God. I love that idea. I love that theme and the way it was explored in that original film. I wasn't expecting much from this one. I was surprised that it was in the book because it just seems like one of those stock spin-off sequels from the great originals of, of horror. And even though it's a few years afterwards, I felt like it was probably one of those, you know, like a Bride of Chucky. Like I, I'm going off that kind of mindset where it's like, you know, maybe a wacky sequel but doesn't have too much to really add to anything, but it's just there to make money. That's how I assumed this film would play out, but I had heard that it was really good. And I wasn't sure whether, well, you know, is it really going to be that good? It just seems so hokey. Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, so they make a wife for him now. You know, it just seems a bit weird to me. I didn't really feel like it was going to be something I'd get that much out of. So, I sat down and watched it this afternoon. Bride of Frankenstein, also directed by James Whale. Now, the 1931 Frankenstein was a, a huge success. Like, a big success. And it gave James Whale the the creative freedom to not just say yes to doing a sequel and he relented towards doing it for quite a while and then when he finally got around to doing this and agreed to make a sequel to Frankenstein he did it on his terms and there were very specific things he wanted to include in the film and if he wasn't allowed to do them he wouldn't do the movie so he very much got to make his film with this and it was on a bigger budget it really shows like some of the sets in this film are unbelievable the forest set is so huge and expansive and not 100% believable, but in that very kind of uh, 30s way, I feel like those artificial sets that are supposed to be outside and you can tell that they're not outside in the slightest, but it has that weird kind of stage play feeling where you let your imagination suck you into the setting and you appreciate the craft of what's gone into it, like this forest with these lush trees and this big kind of uh, half cliff with a waterfall coming down and like really really elaborate stuff that just blew me away the sizes of the rooms inside the houses are just massive expanse just like the height of it and then when we revisit the location from the original film the uh, the big tower you know just the the height of it is unbelievable so from a production design aspect once again for a universal monsters film this one just nails everything then you have the lighting like the cinematography it is just so perfectly done so amazingly fitting for a, a spooky horror tale just the, the the way that the the shadows plays across the faces of the people in the particularly dramatic moments in the film like it uh, it doesn't go for that super dramatic lighting all the time it's just when those moments need the extra punch you know to really just dive you into the faces of the characters as they're going through these very uh, extreme situations in trying to create this new monster, this Bride of Frankenstein, as they say in the film. So, we follow exactly where the first film left off. I had no idea this was a direct sequel. I mean, to me, Bride of Frankenstein, it could have been the seventh film in the series for all I knew, and it could have nothing to do with the original. Yeah, we got Boris Karloff back, but it's just, it's another kind of uh, notch in the Frankenstein cinematic legacy. But this is very much a direct sequel. It picks up exactly where the last one left off, with the mill burning down, with the monster apparently perishing inside, and Henry, who survived at the end of the original film, we get that kind of scene tagged on, where Baron Frankenstein is, is saying, oh yes, he's, 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 he's well, and he's recuperating in bed, and the door opens and you see someone, it's not actually the same actor, because they tagged that ending on to kind of make the audience aware that he didn't die at the end of the, of the mill. In Bride of Frankenstein, it kind of retcons what happens to Henry afterwards, because they assume he's dead, and they take him back to his house, and, uh, and so on, so it, it kind of 
retcons it a little bit. We have a new actress as well playing his wife, so things are a little bit different there. But apart from that, it's pretty much the same. We have Boris Karloff coming back as the monster, of course. Colin Clive coming back as Henry Frankenstein, and he has a, a pretty key part to play in the film. And apparently the actor at the time was going through a lot of alcoholism, and so it was a lot more difficult to work with. And he only lived a few more years after this, which is really tragic. He was only in his 30s, but... It was cool that he got to come back and do the same role here, and his part, again, is very integral because we have this new character coming in, Dr. Pretorius, played by Ernest Thesiger, who is uh, a former professor of, of Henry, and he says that he's been working on similar experiments in creating life, and he wants to get Frankenstein, who he hears has been successful in creating this life, to come and help him finish his experiments because he hasn't got it quite right yet. And there's this amazing sequence where Dr. Pretoria shows Henry these little tubes that he's got, and I'm thinking, what's it, what, what are in those tubes, you know? Come on, what's in the tube? Like, I, I was like, what is good? Like, I was thinking all sorts of stuff, and I wasn't expecting what I was going to see. These little miniature humans, and like, the special effects are incredible because you have these see-through see, these see tubes with little people inside them on like a, th a throne with like elaborate costumes and everything and moving around and everything like that but you know you'd expect that they kind of would cut that piece of the film off and kind of just superimpose it onto the you know the background but you can actually see Pretorius's hand moving behind the see-through jar like it's amazingly done like I don't know how they pulled it off to such, such a degree that it just looked so seamless you know so the special effects in this film are stunning like so so there's a couple of seams around the edges of course but I was so blown away by how good the special effects were in this film particularly that tube sequence with all the little people like I thought okay they'll do two of them but there's like five of them they're all doing different stuff and they're all in the same shot like it was crazy I loved it and it was just so weird and wonderful and and interesting and humorous and just really drew me into this Pretorius character like this is a really interesting guy and he wants to much like Henry create life and so he's trying to bring Frankenstein to, to recreate his monster again and help his former professor to pull off the same feat but Henry is completely averse to this he saw what happened when he made the monster in the first film and he's like I, I can't have anything to do with this so that's that part of it then we have the monster himself who survived uh, the, the burning of the mill. And I like the, the opening scene where we, we start at the beginning of, or the end of the, uh, the, the first film, the beginning of this one. The mill is burning down, the villagers are like, yes, the monster's dead, and they leave and whatever. And there's two people left, and it's the parents of the girl who drowned in the first film. I loved that connection. And this guy he says, I, I can't rest, I can't sleep at night until I see the ashes of that monster. You know, I want to see that he's dead, and so he goes inside, and he ends up getting killed by the monster, so does the woman, and the monster is back, and so, from there, actually, we, we don't really see him for quite a bit in the movie, the monster kind of disappears, but we know that he's still around, he's still alive and kicking, you know, his, his face is kind of scarred and burned a little bit, and I liked how there's a progression to that, and you see his face or his head kind of heal a little bit as the movie progresses, another thing I loved was the prologue of the film, the very beginning, a great kind of model shot zooming in on this kind of castle up on a rock with like you know, moody lighting again just love the way these films look and this one's no different perhaps even the best of the universal monster movies just in terms of the production design the art design just so gothic and so gorgeous to look at just i love having these films on blu-ray to watch it's just awesome and we have the shelley family we have byron we have mary shelley and she sat there you know kind of just minding her own business and the two guys are like can you believe that such a, a cute girl could have written such a horrific tale in frankenstein ah oh, yes yeah, some of my favorite moments in the book she wrote and then we see scenes from the first film and then you know she's like well there's more to the story than what you've read and so, oh do tell us and so she said, well, it starts like this. You remember where we left off? And so I love that kind of linking of kind of showing the, the audience the what happened in the first film in kind of Cliff Notes form uh, in a fun, kind of unique, cool way. I really liked it. I mean, it's a bit meta, but I thought it really worked. And also, the woman who plays Mary Shelley, the woman who wrote the Frankenstein novel to begin with in real life, was played by Elsa Lanchester, who plays the Bride of Frankenstein. So there's that kind of weird duality going on and the the darkness within the person who wrote this story to begin with, being personified by seeing her in this role. I thought that was a brilliant touch, I really enjoyed it. I loved the sequence where the monster is wandering through the forest and we see kind of little 
episodic moments of him trying to kind of find food and people being scared of him and running away, people shooting at him, you know, just complete terror and fear at this monster. And all he wants is just to kind of, you know, exist, you know, he, he hasn't got this intention to kill or to maim, but he gets kind of thrown into it. And I love that conflicting nature that you get from the monster and it's all down to Boris Karloff's incredible performance in my opinion this is what really makes the film and we have this fantastic sequence where he comes across a hut and there's a, an old blind man in there playing the violin and the monster kind of smiles as he hears this beautiful music and he comes inside and you know I could just go through all the beats of that sequence in the film um, but if you've seen it you know what I'm talking about and I love that connection between the blind man and the monster and yeah I, I kind of saw where it was going because I've seen young Frankenstein and so it was kind of a riff on that uh, when they did the blind man scene but it's so beautiful where the blind man can't see how horrific this monster is so he doesn't judge him and tries to help him and the monster can't speak either so they, they can't really communicate with each other but there's this kind of um, symbiotic relationship that forms I almost feel like it's a little bit rushed because we see the scene of the meeting and then there's the following day and it seems to progress a bit more. So it could be like, you know, a week later. But I feel like, I don't know, I'm not sure how long they really spent with each other. But I feel like it, it needed to be longer than one day. But it, the film doesn't make it that clear. Because the monster starts to speak. And uh, Boris Karloff was completely against this. He didn't want the monster to speak. He thought it ruined everything about that character. You take that great silent performance from the original film and then you add words to it. And it kind of maybe dilutes the essence of what made it so special to begin with. But... It's great, it really is, and his daughter, I watched the Making of documentary on the Blu-ray, his daughter said that, yeah, he was against the monster speaking, but uh, he was wrong. <laughs> History has proven my father wrong, uh, and yet, yeah, like, he does it so well. Just simple words, you know, there is a scene when he meets uh, Dr. Pretorius in a tomb, where he's speaking a bit more eloquently than I would have liked. Apparently that's what happens in the original novel, the monster can speak and so on, but it jumps from, you know, drink good smoke good to you know much more elaborate sentences i mean it's still truncated but i guess you could kind of reason that the blind man had, had taught him to speak and he was starting to piece things together for himself and we do get a moment where he assures the blind man that he can understand what he's saying even if he can't speak himself so that hints to some sort of intelligence i guess that kind of explains it now that i've thought about it but um the, the blind man sequence I just thought was was beautiful, it really was. Uh, there's a bit of religious symbolism going on in the film that's maybe not the most subtle, I have to say, with Jesus on the cross and then having Frankenstein put up on the cross and stuff. So that stuff doesn't really do too much for me or add too much to the story, but I see what, where they're going with it and the idea again of God and creating mankind and things like that. So I guess for other people that might be more interesting to kind of think about and to get something more out of the film or it might make people get less out of the film, it might offend them in some way, I don't really know too much to be honest because religion has never really played a big part in my life but it was definitely obvious that uh, there was some religious symbolism going on in this film with uh, again the idea of creation and, and Jesus and God and that kind of stuff. I loved the, the bride of Frankenstein character, the, fe the female monster and the whole sequence of creating her. We had Dw Dwight Fry coming back uh, to play a character. He, of course, played the, the hunchback in the original film who died. So he plays another kind of wild and wacky eccentric kind of helper character. And he's, he's really funny. And I just love Dwight Fry. He's fantastic. But <laughs> I love the scene when uh, Pretorius is looking for a female body to kind of you know scavenge parts from to build this cadaver. And they open a coffin and it's just, it's just, this is bones, you know, just, just absolute, just complete skeleton. And Dwight Fry's character in, in this film goes, oh, she's a pretty looking thing, isn't she? <laughs> just a, <laughs> a really well delivered line that really cracked me up. There's, there's some good humor in the film without it being anywhere near approaching comedic. It just has those little beats throughout that kind of, like there's no comedic scenes, but there's comedic moments that really work. And again, Boris Karloff, like the humanity that he shows within this monster, is such a great kind of contrast. You know, you just see this this thing that's just like literally the head has been stapled together and stuff, and he's burnt, he's shot, he's kind of this just absolute terror of, of a visual. 
and yet he has this this humanity that's trying to break out, that's trying to push past uh, everything that's hindering him. A scene where you know a tear rolls down his cheek, you know that he feels, but he, yet he's this this murderous creation, this ghastly creation. Like it's it's just so I love it. I really love it. And his performance is again just beating a dead horse at this point, but his performance really makes the film work. And finally, we get kind of the scene where Henry Frankenstein is convinced to kind of help Pretorius build this other monster, this female monster, a bride for Frankenstein, uh, by kidnapping his wife, and so he's kind of forced into it. I like that. I like that Henry Frankenstein wasn't like, okay, I'll help you make another monster. He really feels the repercussions of what happened in the first film. He doesn't want anything to do with it. You know, nothing you say will make me help you with this, until, of course, they kidnap his wife, and he has no choice. So I, I loved that. I really did. And then, you know, the final sequence where they, they build a bride. I wasn't expecting this, that she would only be in the film for about two or three minutes all told as far as being on screen but man does Elsa Lanchester just cast an absolute kind of spell over the entire film with her wordless performance uh, as the bride of Frankenstein like the the crazy hair is iconic you know like it's just such a great piece of um, makeup and kind of just uh, design you know, of, of, of the hair like it just it casts this really iconic image that I think everyone knows I think most people will look at that and go, oh, Bride of Frankenstein even if they haven't seen the film because I hadn't seen the film you know for my entire 29 years of existence up until this afternoon and I feel like I've always known that that kind of shock hair was the Bride of Frankenstein it's one of those iconic images of cinema and again I didn't realize it was such a short appearance but it's so powerful and maybe this is spoiling things but this has been a very long video so if you've listened this far you've probably seen the film but I loved how much the monster wanted this wife he wanted someone he could connect with he wanted someone to love him for who he was because it seemed like no human could and so he wanted a wife he wanted someone dead because he recognized that he was dead and when she gets created and she sees him and he comes towards her she's frightened and Ah, oh, the cruel, cruel, heartbreaking irony that even a monster can't love him, you know, and just like that realization on his face, she hate me. And that's when he just decides to just, just end it all. Like, it's it's tragic, it really is, but it's it, it's so fitting for the story and for the idea of man playing around with things that he shouldn't be playing around with. Now, on the, docu the documentary on the Blu-ray, people are praising this film to high heaven. You know, there's one guy who said, this is unarguably and undoubtedly the greatest horror film of all time. This is up there with Citizen Kane. I'm like, hang on just a minute. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'll be damned if it isn't one of the best. I mean, it's not really a scary film, but it's, uh, it's that horror of meddling with things that you shouldn't meddle with. And also the horror of the mob mentality, which is pretty much covered in full form in the first film but again we have that kind of mob mentality where there's the monster let's get him and they're literally like you know almost pitchforks you know torches in hand let's get this guy although they do lock him up they don't kill him which i thought was interesting i thought that that would be the the end goal so that was actually quite an interesting note but it's that idea of, of not understanding something that lo looks different you know, I mean, obviously he had been murdering people, so that kind of plays into it. But the general idea that this monster, scary on the outside, feeling on the inside, but uh, but can't express itself. And I just think that's, that's just a really interesting theme to explore in a story. Because uh, a lot of us are scared of what we don't know. Uh, and are quick to jump to, 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 to fear and then anger, you know, rather than understanding. Trying to understand. And that is perfectly perfectly exemplified in that scene with the blind man where he doesn't judge based on the looks and uh you know it all goes well they become friends you know uh because of that humanity that he shows which he's able to show because he can't see how horrible that the monster looks anyway suffice it to say i've rambled on for so long i absolutely adored this film it is better than the original and i think it uh it, it just it went more to those beats that were so good in the original film where you looked into the the psyche of this monster and that he he wanted to to be more than what he was. He wanted to uh, kind of connect with people, but he just didn't have all the working parts inside his artificially created brain to be normal. Uh, and so it's that kind of heartbreaking struggle of something that, that wants to do right, but doesn't know how to do it. So the, these films are tragedies, but um, they're very enjoyable and uh, affecting as well. I just, yeah, I really loved everything about this film. Is it a film you should see before you die? Absolutely, even more so than the original, I feel. 
Uh, definitely a horror classic, uh, definitely a horror masterpiece, you know, as far as these Universal Monster movies go, this one for me is right up there with The Invisible Man, uh, Dracula and Frankenstein, and maybe even better than most of those. So, yeah, absolutely loved it. Leave your thoughts down below if you've seen the film. Uh, you probably have if you again, watched the video this far, but I'd like to hear your thoughts if you have any. If you have any thoughts on any of the other Frankenstein movies, I know there's a Son of Frankenstein, Karloff did one more film. But apart from that, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.